Welcome to Social Studies at the Center. Okay, today we are going to talk a little bit about the economy and about different prices of things. So we're going to start by playing The Price is Right. But we're putting a little bit of a twist on it if you've played it before. Um, this time I want you to think about what you would spend for it and then guess the actual price. So we're going to start off with a four and a half foot Christmas tree. So I want you to think about how much you personally would spend on this Christmas tree. And if you need to pause the video to write down your guesses, then you're more than welcome to. And now think about how much you think the Christmas tree actually is. Is it more or less than your guess? Tell me what you think. So once you have those two guesses written down, I'll tell you this Christmas tree is $299. Now, I don't think I personally would spend that much on this Christmas tree, but some people are. Our next thing is this candle. Again, I want you to think about how much you would spend for it and then how much you think it actually is. If you need to pause to write down those guesses, you can. But this candle is $46. Again, I don't know if I would pay that much for a candle, but some people do. Our next item is holiday pajamas. I love having matching pajamas for my family. So I might pay a little bit more for these. But how much do you think that they are? These pajamas are $14.66 a pair, which I feel like isn't bad. But maybe you feel differently. Our next item is five pounds of candy. Now that's a lot of candy. So how much do you think that it costs and how much would you be willing to pay for it? If you're someone that doesn't like chocolate, you might not be willing to pay that much for it. If you're someone who loves chocolate and has to have chocolate, you might be willing to pay more. But the asking price for this candy is $43.95. That's a lot of candy. Okay, our next item is these snowflake Christmas lights. Super cute. How much would you pay for them? They are $6.99. Not bad. I probably would buy those. And our last thing is this oil painting. And this oil painting is going to cost $99. So who decides if the price is right? You get to decide if the price is right for you to buy something. If you look at something and you're like, that price is crazy, then you're probably not going to buy it. If you look at something and say, that's super cheap, then maybe you'll buy it even if it wasn't what you were intending to buy originally. But as the consumers and the customers, we actually get to decide the prices. Now you might be a little confused about that. You might say, I don't get to decide how much I spend on my food when I go to McDonald's, which is true. You don't get to decide specifically, but the customers do. And so if the customers are saying, the French fries at McDonald's are too expensive, and so they stop buying them as regularly, then McDonald's is gonna lower those prices because the customer isn't buying at the price it is. If I decided I'm going to start selling hot chocolate on the side of the road and I am charging $100 a cup, not very many people are going to stop and buy my hot chocolate, probably no one. Because the price is too high, and the customer is deciding that that price is not worth it versus if I have my price for my hot chocolate at 50 cents and I have tons of people coming to buy it, then maybe next week when I have my hot chocolate stand, I'm going to up the price to a dollar and see if the customers continue to buy the hot chocolate. And so that is how we as consumers get to actually decide on the prices of items because if we're not buying them, people aren't making money, so they're going to have to lower those prices so that we'll buy them. I'm sure that you're a little bit curious about why all of those prices were so crazy. And who decides that something costs a ridiculous amount of money? Well, some other things seem to be a little bit more reasonable. Well, 
back in 1776, the same year that the United States was declaring independence from Great Britain, this man named Adam Smith decided to write a book explaining a little bit about that. His book was called The Wealth of the Nations, and it described how the economy works. Now, the economy is a big word that means that that is everything that we're buying, selling, and how the world goes around to make it so that we can get all of the everyday items that we need to survive and live our normal lives. Well, Adam Smith decided that the best idea for an economy was capitalism. And it just so happens that today, capitalism is what we still use in the United States. But what is capitalism? Capitalism means that the consumer decides what the price is. Now, I know what you're thinking. We don't go to the grocery store and tell the cl store clerk how much money we're willing to pay them for a gallon of milk. We go and the gallon of milk is what it costs. But that's not quite what Adam Smith meant. He meant that the consumer, the people who are buying the product, will determine the price by if it's too expensive, then no one will buy it. But if it's something that's worthwhile and it's worth the price, then people will buy it. And so that means from Adam Smith's perspective that we don't have to worry about the government setting prices or telling the producers, who are the people who are making these supplies that we, the consumers, need, they don't need to, t the government doesn't need to tell the producers how much to make or how much they should charge for it. Instead, Adam Smith called it the invisible hand, which means that if the price is too high or the product isn't good enough, then no one will buy it and then the price will naturally go down. But if, it, if it's something that everybody wants, then the price will naturally go up. And so this idea of the invisible hand means that the government doesn't need to control the economy, but because of capitalism and because of the way that the consumer influences prices, we have the invisible hand that controls the economy for us. Now, I want you to take a second and go ahead and look at this joke. And you can pause the video and consider why would somebody write this thinking that it was funny or what is the joke behind this little cartoon. Now, diving in a little bit deeper into some of Adam Smith's ideas, he talked in about supply and demand. And supply and demand is how we figure out and guess how the economy is going to work based off of the demand, which is how much people want for the product and the supply of how much of the product there is. And what Adam Smith determined is that because the demand, which is set by the consumer, who is the people who are buying it, if the demand goes up, then that means that price is most likely going to go up. But if demand goes down, then the price will most likely go down. And then along with supply, if the price goes up, then the producers are going to want to make more because they can make more money. Whereas if the price is low, then they won't want to make as many because they won't be able to make as much money. And so we can see on this graph, it's called a supply and demand graph in the red. We have the demand that's going down as the price is more, the demand goes down and the supply goes up as this price of the product goes up. But right in the middle, we have this spot where they cross and that is the perfect place for the suppliers to make as much of the product as they want and for the demand that people are still going to want some because supply and demand also do something that's a little bit interesting that makes it a little bit tricky is if we make more of something, then demand usually goes down. And same with if there's not very many, then demand will go up. And that's 
if you imagine there's only one candy bar in a vending machine and you want to have a candy bar, well, if there's 30 other people who want that same candy bar, then the price is going to go up and your demand might be super high for that one candy bar. But if the vending machine's full and you're able, and you know that you'll be able to get a candy bar, then your demand might not be as high because you know that you'll be able to get a candy bar tomorrow or you can wait in line for the candy bar and it won't make as big of a difference. And now I have one other joke for you to look at and you can pause the video and consider why the surprise for the alien's ship part might be so much knowing what you know about supply and demand now that we've talked a little bit about Adam Smith's big ideas, we're going to go into some more of some real life examples about this in our world today. Now that we've talked about a little bit about the economy, let's look into some supply and demand scenarios that I have for you today. Now, I'm assuming as you're watching this, that it's after Halloween. Now, I want you to think about Halloween candy specifically. Before Halloween, you saw lots and lots of candy. But what about after Halloween? Think about the supply of the, the candy and the demand of the consumers, the buyers. Why don't you pause the video and think what happens between the before and after. I have something to show you. This is a graph that you saw earlier, very similar, where it has the price and the quantity. The blue line is the supply and the red is the demand. After Halloween, the demand goes down. If you look in the stores today, or after Halloween, you'll see that there isn't any Halloween candy. So the demand has gone down. And so suppliers and the supply have also gone down. What do you think happens with the price? Did the price go up or did it go down? Let's look at Christmas. We have Christmas trees and decorations. I'm assuming that this is before Christmas or walking right up to Christmas and you see a lot of the supply going up. Why don't you pause the video when you're ready and think what the supply and demand would be and how that would affect the price. Well, here's another graph for you to look at if you want to look at it. Now, if you're thinking in December, everything goes up in price and supply and demand. Okay, understandable. But what about after? In January, do Christmas trees stay the same price or do they go down? Why don't you think about that? Now, here's something that I thought was fun. Pineapples. I like to eat pineapples. Do you like pineapples? Their peak season, as you can see on the screen, is March through July. Now, think about that time. Do you think the demand and price or supply would go up? What would happen to the price? And what do you think about every other month when it's not their peak season? What happens then? Pause the video and think through it. All right, here we go. Here is what the graph would technically look like. The supply is the highest, the demand is the highest within these few months. That's when you get the best pineapples. You got a price to match it. The suppliers, the producers have to match it. Here we go. I have a little review put into words for you. If you wanna pause the video and look at that, I think that'll help cement the idea in your mind. All 
right. Well, we have an amazing guest speaker to come in and talk to you today who works in a restaurant. So he works with supply and demand daily. And let's see what he has to say. Okay, so this is my dad, Mike Ritchie, and he is an owner of Golden Crow. And so he's had to figure out what to order, how much supplies he needs for the demand of the people in the restaurant. So what are the things that you have to look at to figure out how much to order and why is that important? Well, so you have to look at everything really, any, any product that you use, whether it be food or it be, you know, to go containers, whatever, anything that is used in the restaurant has to be ordered. Normally we would get, we get about two deliveries a week of most food products and then highly perishable things like produce, fresh chicken, things like that um, uh, comes in usually four times a week. Okay, and what types of things, did you order the same amount of those items every week? Or did you have to fluctuate dependent on what time of the week it was or what time of the year? Yeah, so it's going to vary uh, based on volume. And so, you know, different restaurants uh, serve different amounts of people and even the same restaurant week to week can vary. So we have to do projections on what we anticipate business being. And then we use a computer program that the, the, we, we call UP100, it's usage per 100 guests is basically how it works. So whether it's ordering bulk product in from a supplier or producing enough you know, meatloaf for that day or cooking enough meatloaf to get you through the next hour, we base all that on our projections of how many we're gonna use. So for example, if we're gonna use if our usage per 100 on meatloaf is, um, is two, then we know for every 100 guests that we're gonna serve, we need to produce two meatloafs. So if, if we think we're gonna serve 800 people that day, then we have to produce you know, 16 meatloafs. And then if we're gonna serve 100 people that hour, then we need to cook two meatloafs to be done in time to serve them <clears throat> that hour. Okay, and you got pretty good at assuming these numbers? Well, so history is a good um, indicator. So we look at a, a couple of things. One, we look at that same week in the prior year, and then we have a pretty good understanding of, uh, of, of kind of seasonality and those kind of things. We look for you know unique events. If there was a major snowstorm, then obviously, uh, last year, then that's going to affect things a little bit. But uh, so we're going to look at things like that. And then we're going to look at our trend. So we say, okay, we look at this same week last year. And then we look at the last few weeks and say what we're trending up 3% or 5% or whatever it is. And we're going to take last year's guest count uh, and then increase it by whatever our trend is. And then that gives us a pretty good idea of what we're going to order uh, for all of our products. And then we have build twos or, you know, the number we get to. So if we're ordering bulk product and there's two on the shelf and, and the usage per hundred says we're going to need, you know, 20 of them, then uh, the, the computer program will, will place an order for 18 of those items to come in on the next, on the next delivery truck. Okay. And did you ever have times that you got way too much or not enough of things? Yeah, I mean, sometimes we misorder. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, there, there's a problem. Uh, for instance, with COVID, we've had lots and lots of issues with, with our suppliers. I'll give you a recent example where our onion ring supplier called and said, hey, I know I'm supposed to provide all the restaurants in your system with onion rings. And so, you know, that's literally millions of pounds of onion rings a year but they said we we can't we normally run three shifts in our factory and so we're producing nearly 24 hours a day we're producing onion rings and we can't staff that and so we're we're running two shifts but one of them is not a full fully staffed shift so we're producing you know almost 
half of the number of onion rings that we need to. And so because of that, we're, we're gonna be unable to supply you with onion rings. So you get that phone call, you know that it's coming and now you start limiting and say, well, you can get onion rings, but you know, when you order, when you order 30 cases, you might only get 10. Um, and so then you deal with it and try to run something else. Um, people get used to certain products that they love. And so we hate to be out, but sometimes that happens. Okay. And what do you do to prepare for like special occasions? Like I know Thanksgiving is an extremely busy day at Golden Crow. Are there, what things do you have to change to get ready for Thanksgiving versus a regular Thursday? Yeah, so the menu mix uh, will change significantly on a day like, like Thanksgiving. So, um, you know, obviously you're going to bring in a whole lot more turkey than you would on an average Thursday. Uh, but it, it's still, you know, shocking that our average restaurant still goes through over 800 pounds of steak on Thanksgiving Day. So people don't eat, just eat, you know, Thanksgiving meal. But, um, yeah, so we, we again, we go back to... The, the, that same event. So in this case, Thanksgiving of prior years, how many people did we serve and what was our, and, the, and what's our trend? Are we trending up? And, and so we'll adjust that. So if you say, okay, pumpkin pie, maybe a normal week, we would serve, you know, 50 or 60 pumpkin pies in a week. Well, we might serve 300, 350 on one day because everybody eats pumpkin pie or some kind of pie on Thanksgiving or a lot of people do compared to a normal day. So again, we go back and we track and then it, it, we can get a pretty good guess from another restaurant in a similar demographic uh, for the first year we're open. And then we track very carefully. Okay. At the end of Thanksgiving this year, we're going to write down exactly how many pumpkin pies we used, how many how much mashed potatoes we went through, how many turkeys we cooked, all those kind of things. And so then the next year, when we go back and look, we say, okay, we anticipate serving this many more people. So we're going to increase, you know, the number of pumpkin pies by 10%. And uh, we can get pretty accurate with that. The, the models work fairly well. Uh, sometimes you produce a little too much, or sometimes you're, you know, you're running low. And so we're monitoring it on the, all through Thanksgiving day, we're monitoring, okay, how many turkeys have we used? How many do we have left? How many guests have we served? How many guests do we anticipate coming in? Okay, let's go look at pumpkin pie. Let's go look at those things that you just can't run out of on Thanksgiving day or people are very upset. We're monitoring that. So at, at two o'clock in the afternoon, we may be looking and saying, we are trending uh, using more pie than we, pumpkin pie than we thought. So we might be cooking more pumpkin pie at two o'clock and then serving them at six or seven o'clock at night, because we've, you know, so we're, we're constantly monitoring, monitoring that. On a normal Tuesday, hey, you run, you know, six o'clock at night, you run out of pumpkin pie. There's plenty of other options. People aren't too upset, but on Thanksgiving, you can't do that. So, uh, but, you know, technology is amazing. It allows us to put stuff in a computer, get the stuff ordered in, tell us how much to produce, and then down to how much to bake or, or cook, you know, for a given time frame. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. You're welcome. Now that we've been able to talk a little bit about Adam Smith and his idea for supply and demand, I would like to go ahead and talk to you more specifically about what specialization is um, and the idea of how it helps the economy. So there are two variations of specialization in the, the economy. Um, the first one that I would like to address is the specialization for individual companies. Um, so specialization, just so you have a little bit more background knowledge, is when a company focuses on producing and selling one specific item or product. So the first example I have for you to look at um, is the company called Diamondback Bikes. Now, if you haven't heard of what Diamondback Bikes is, it's a bike company um, that focuses on bikes that go on mountainsides and for a sport called BMX. Um, a lot goes into building and making and selling bicycles. But I am curious to, to see or know how much you know about what it takes to produce a bike. 
so when you look at this picture here um, of this bicycle, you see a lot of different moving parts. And I'm sure you've been on plenty of bike rides before. Well, it's not just the frame and the tires that go into building a bike. There's a lot more to it. You have to look at how much it costs to make a bike, what each um, item on the bike, like each tire, each tread, the seat, how much those things cost. You also have to look at things like how much or how many people it takes to build a bike um, and how much labor goes into it. So looking at this bike here, you see a couple tires, you see the handlebars, the seat, you also see the paint. What do you think it, how, what do you think it takes to make this bike become a bike? Where do you think they got the paint from? Who put on the paint? What about the handlebars or the brakes? Where do they get those parts? Or the track? or the tires, all those parts are moving parts that go into a bicycle, but they all stem from somewhere. And Diamondback Bikes uh, focuses on creating those specific bikes, which are extremely expensive. Um, they go up to seven, $8,000 for a single mountain bike. Um, they take a lot of work. However, because of specialization, this company is able to hone in and focus on just the bike itself. However, there's another kind of specialization where a company can focus on several kinds of products. Um, so one example that I have here is Johnson & Johnson. Now, I'm sure you've heard of Johnson & Johnson. It's a very big company, but they make all sorts of things. Anything from vaccinations, um, like the COVID-19 vaccination to mouthwash, baby soap, Tylenol, um, and even things like allergy medication. So again, there are two different kinds of specialization. There's one specialization where a company focuses on one product and one product only. And there are certain people and groups that hone in on that specific part of the product. And then there's the other side of specialization, like Johnson & Johnson, where this company focuses on lots of different products, and they have different groups and people and teams working to build these certain products and to sell them. Um, something else, too, that I would like to talk about are some of the benefits of specialization. One being that because you're able to focus on one specific part of a product or just one product, you're able to produce more quickly and it's more cost efficient, meaning it can be a lot cheaper. Uh, specialization is also beneficial, even if one person or company is able to do multiple things, but being able to focus again on that one specific task or product allows the company to perfect that product. And there is one disadvantage, or there's multiple, but one that I would like to focus on um, for specialization is that in case the economy goes down or the request for certain products goes down, that company loses out on money and they end up losing employees and work because that product is no longer needed or wanted. So that's a disadvantage to specialization as well. I have one more example um, for specialization that goes along with, well, I have two more examples that go along with specialization. Uh, one being the Crocs company. Now I know we've all heard about Crocs. Um, they're a very big shoe brand. And this Crocs company only focuses on making shoes. So unlike Johnson & Johnson, where they focus on multiple products, Crocs is just like the bike company I showed you previously, where they only focus on one product, which is shoes. Now, the last example I would like to show you um, that demonstrates what specialization is, is the Ticonderoga <laughs> pencil. Try to say that 10 times fast. Um, but this pencil company um, 
Dixon Company, they specialize in manufacturing wooden pencils. Um, now, again, the things to, to think about when you're talking about specialization is how much does it cost to make a pencil? What are they selling it for? Like, how much does it cost to buy the pencil? How many steps go into making said pencil? And uh, how many people does it take to run the factory or the company to build the pencil? And did you know a single pencil only costs four cents to make, but you can go to Walmart and buy them for 97 cents up to a dollar for a pack of pencils. Isn't that fascinating? One single pencil only costs four cents, but a pack of pencil, they'll charge you about a dollar. How cool is that? Now, one of these pictures here, you'll see the different stages a pencil goes through. It just starts with a block of wood, and then they put the graphite in the middle, and they paint it, and they sand it down to the um, perfect shape that they want, and then they put their label on, and then they put the tin or plastic, however the pencil want, the company wants to make them, and then along with the eraser. So I would invite you um, at the end of this video to go ahead and visit one of the links that um, we will have attached that kind of shows you step-by-steps of specialization in creating pencils. We would also like to invite you to watch the video, How to Make a $1,700 Chocolate Video. Um, and you'll notice in this video, the gentleman does not use specialization. So while you watch this video, maybe afterwards, we'd like to invite you to see if you can find something to make or create um, without specialization. And how much would it cost you to make said creation um, or invention of some sort?